Good morning, everyone across the United States that have signed up for our regional community workshop. My name is Kelly Cox. I'm Director of Support Groups on the Western United States and Senior Director of this program, the Regional Community Workshops. I want to tell you, we've done this a few times here. Our, our sponsors have joined us again this year. It's Amgen, GSK, Cario Farm, Takeda, Jansen, and Bristol Myers Squibb, all companies that are trying to fight the myeloma program. We do this program for you and because of you. Please, please take time to fill out the feedback survey because it's at that time we find out if there's some way to better our program in a myriad of facets to help you as a patient. Because at the IMF, you're never alone. You're a phone call away from help and you're an email away from help. So just always think about that when you're late at night taking these drugs and upsetting your wife or your partner because you decided to mow the lawn. We don't want you mowing the lawn. We want you calling the IMF and getting your answers. Today, we've switched things up a little bit to help out Dr. Fonseca. And what we're gonna start with here at about 10.05 or shortly hereafter is Dr. Fonseca will talk about relapse therapy and clinical trials, two incredible important topics, whether you're a beginner or you've been in this for a while. Then we'll have some question and answers with the panel, which would be Dr. Ganguly and Dr. Fonseca and Tiffany Richards. We're going to take a little meditation and stretch break because sitting in a chair for an hour is not good. 11.05, we start with Sid at Myeloma 101 and Frontline Therapy. So he's going to go into some basics that you have to know before you go into other other. Uh, approaches to your myeloma. Then we have Tiffany Richards, who's going to is going to speak to how to manage myeloma symptoms and side effects. These are five tried and true topics that are going to help you out, and then you'll have question and answers times with this. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Fonseca. A, a, got a friend of twenty years plus, and he's with the Mayo Clinic in Phoenix, and he's going to start right now. Dr. Fonseca, welcome to the program, and thank you for working on a Saturday. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Kelly, for the invitation and for the, uh, you know, organization of this to the IMF. It's a, a tremendous resource for patients. I also want to thank everyone who's joining us as well as my co-participants uh, for their flexibility as well, too, for the, for the schedule change. So let me go ahead and, and, and get started here. Um, so first, as we customary do, this are my disclosures. And like Kelly mentioned, companies we have been working with in the fight against uh, multiple myeloma. Now, I was asked to talk about uh, clinical trials and uh, relapse and refractory disease. And uh, you, you will see that uh, we will mention them throughout the, uh, the sessions today. And some of you are very familiar with this. Uh, but I'd like to set the stage because I'm going to show you data for clinical trials and, and this is a question we get often from patients as well, too, which is, you know, what, what are the various clinical trials and, you know, how do I decide whether I participate or not? And this is just a, a, a general, uh, you know, description of how we think about this clinical trial. So this is important for you to realize because you may be faced with that decision as you go to uh, the various centers where you are treated. Keep in mind before I explain them that no one would ever do a clinical trial without you knowing. So, so informed consent is an essential part of a clinical trial. And clinical trials are always voluntary. So I always tell patients, hey, listen, we'll care for you as well. We will love you as much if you participate or not. We believe it's important to do them, but your care will not be affected in any way because you, for some reason or for no reason at all, may elect not to participate in clinical trials. So that's very important. No one would do anything experimental without the patient consent. Um, and, and then if, if you were to say, well, this is interesting, I want to participate in, in these trials, these are the options uh, that we have. So we have what we call phase one trials and phase one trials are directed towards, um, you know, the first time that we test a medication or an intervention as treatment for a disease. And often we think of them as understanding potential side effects, which means we start with very low doses, uh, doses that are thought to be safe. And then you can start escalating and then go on, you know, at some point there might be something that comes up with toxicity that prevents someone from using a higher dose. And that's what we do with, uh, with uh, you know, phase one clinical trials. Now, people historically thought of phase one clinical trials almost like a taking one for the team, meaning, you know, this drug's low doses, we don't really know, but, you know, at least I'm helping someone else. 
The reality is that in multiple myeloma, most of the phase one trials already come with a significant body of knowledge that would support us conducting these trials. In fact, there are some studies that suggest that the response rates may be seen in up to 40% of patients that go into phase one trials for myeloma. So I think there is more than just kind of a quote unquote, a shot in the dark. We actually have reason to believe that phase ones may be a great option. In fact, a lot of what you're going to see and you're going to hear about the you know, CAR T cells and the bispecific an uh, antibodies, they are still in phase one. And you know, we are excited by the results because yes, we want to learn about toxicity, but we're excited about the results. The next one is phase two. Phase two is when you take a straight cohort of people and there's a number of patients that are going to be treated with that intervention. And what you try to determine is if it you know, has some good efficacy. So you, you want to get some precision on what fraction of patients will respond, how deep, et cetera. So usually that means that, that whatever treatment is being provided is you know, safe and that, that we have um, at least a sense of what might be a good dose for that. Uh, phase two trials are very attractive and the person always knows what they're getting. So, you know, if you're going to get a phase two trial and they're going to say, we're going to use drug A, that means you're going to get drug A in the, in the, you know, schedule and route of administration and all of that, that, that you're told. So that's what, what phase two trial is now very importantly, and this is where there's a lot of misconception. <clears throat> it's this phase three trials. So phase three trials is when you test something new as improving what is the standard of care? Okay, so these trials are usually, if you may, flip of a coin and half of the group gets something, half of the group gets something else. First, again, you won't have this done without your consent. Second of all, when, when we think about comparing to the standard of care, if you're in the arm that does not get the standard of care, uh, that does not get the experimental treatment, you're getting the standard of care. Now, that may be, let's say, drug B, or that may be in some circumstances observation, like you have seen with the clinical trials for smoldering and multiple myeloma. The experimental arm is what adds something. So it adds usually you know, a drug or a cell therapy, et cetera. Now, sometimes, uh, because uh, we are all humans, physicians, uh, you know, we, we like to think very highly of our you know, hypothesis, our clinical trials, and it's been determined that sometimes it's better that no one knows who's getting what, and that's what's called a double-blinded study, meaning uh, you know, a person can get uh, a new treatment and, and the person in the other arm might get a similar pill, but it, in fact, it's not a treatment. It's like a sugar pill. But remember, everyone is getting the standard of care. It's not like treatment has been withheld from anyone. But if you do that that way, then you know exactly what uh, the merits of that intervention are. And, and, and this is really the most advanced phase of clinical trials. And oftentimes, these trials are the ones that lead to FDA approvals. So as you consider trials, think about you know, what I just said, and I think it's important because uh, uh, this is the way where we have made all this progress, 20 plus approvals by the FDA. Uh, it's been a lot of work and you know, trust and participation by patients and families. And, and, and again, this is, this is how things have been able to move forward. Now, I won't go much into the detail. We have observational studies, which are not really clinical trials, but sometimes you may be asked to participate in, you know, in a study where people are going to track things, or maybe people go back and look at the medical record. And those are important because they also build the fund of knowledge. And last but not least, I, I have to say a word about biobanking. The same is true again. No one would bank samples from you, that is from the blood or from the bone marrow or something else, unless they have your explicit consent. But if you're going to take blood, sometimes we may ask, can we take a little bit more so we can store that for research? Or if, or if someone is having a bone marrow, can we take a little bit more of that bone marrow and use it for research purposes? And, and this has been critical in, in furthering our understanding of the disease. So I know I, I you know, spent quite a bit of time on this particular slide, but I want to make sure that you understand what the phases are. So again, one, toxicity. Two is efficacy, and three is when we compare the new intervention with the standard of care. And, and again, this is how, how we have made, made significant progress. Now, one of the things I'll show you next, I, I made this slide up, you know, it's almost like 20 years, Kelly, since we probably know each other, and I have, have had the pleasure of changing the numbers of the slide. And if you look at, uh, you know, nowadays, it should be 2022, and you look at, you know, what we're able to achieve, uh, you know, if you think about, you know, patients that go through the first phase of induction treatment, if you're transplant eligible, you complete the transplant. That takes about, about you know, eight months in the ideal world. And, you know, most people can do that. 
Then if you look at the data that we have for maintenance clinical trials, you're going to hear more about that. That's, you know, it's over half year, half, you know, four and a half years. And then if you look at the best clinical trials that we have for myeloma that comes back, which I'm going to show you next, we have expectations of at least another three years with optimal therapy. So this is not perfect. We wish we had a treatment that was one week, no side effects is done and over. You don't have to deal with multiple myeloma. But as we have introduced all of these drugs into the clinical practice, we can think of many years for expected survival, sometimes eight, you know, 10 years plus. And I particularly hold a view, which is uh, uh, controversial, it's not widely accepted, but I hold a view that already a fraction of myeloma patients that get optimal therapy up front can be cured from their disease because of all of this progress that we have seen. So I hope to be able to, you know, uh, go and uh, scrutinize this statement in 10 or in 15 years and say, yes, we found this was one of the ways and this were some of the patients for which this was happened. But I sincerely hope that really our statement is now we know how to do it and we can do it for most patients. But there is no question there is significant progress in the treatment of, of, of the disease. Now I'm going to take you to the next next slide here, uh, which talks about a process that we call attrition, and and what you see it's a graph that is meant to represent the number of patients that go from what we call one line of therapy. So that is you know the first time someone receives treatment to the second one to the third and so forth, and and this is very important. This is very important for you to know, and I, I tell my patients this all the time as well too. What you see is that it comes down like this. And the reason it comes down like that is because it's less likely for someone to go into a third or fourth or a fifth line of treatment. And there's multiple reasons for this. Obviously, sometimes some, someone does very well. They don't need more treatment. Uh, sometimes a patient prefers not to have treatment anymore. They had a bad experience or unfortunately, sometimes also the disease is difficult to control. So we cannot provide a next line of treatment. The point here is that it does not make sense to save uh, your powder dry for the future. So whenever we're considering treatment and we're going more and more in this direction in multiple myeloma, you have to best use the best treatments up front uh, uh, in the hopes of creating the longest duration of disease control. And, and you know, this is, this is uh, of course, in my opinion, very, very important. I'm going to show you some data. I'm going to, I'm going to run through clinical trials. I won't go into the technicality, so please don't be uh, put off as you see graphs and some of the numbers. I just want to tell you about big concepts that come out because of this, this clinical trials. So when we talk about relapse, perhaps one of the most important landmark moments was when this study was published. Uh, so our colleagues, uh, led by Dr. Dimopoulos, published a study that compared three drugs to two drugs, a phase three study, in the setting of myeloma that was coming back, relapsing myeloma. And the drugs were the uh, daratumumab, uh, which can be subcutaneous or intravenous, as you know, uh, lenalidomide, which is a revlimid, and dexamethasone. Those are, those are the three drugs that were being tested in this particular study. And uh, what Dr. Dimopoulos was able to show was that if you, if you actually compare three drugs versus two, there's a, a huge difference in how much uh, time one could control the disease. Now, these are, this are curves that represent the results of this clinical trials. Let me just explain them to you in a second because you're going to see more curves throughout the day. Some of you are familiar with this. Here, uh, the curves and the x-axis, on, so on the bottom part, you have time. So the farther out you go to the right, the farther out you're from the time you enrolled in that clinical trial. The vertical, the y-axis represents percent. So you start with everyone at the starting point at 100%, right? You see that at the very top left part of our graph. Now, in this study, what they're measuring is something that's called progression-free survival. And what it means is every time someone experiences an event that tells the physician team how this person seems to have myeloma, that it's not being further controlled by this, that is, it's progressing, the curve goes down by a little bit. So in the ideal world, curves like this that you see in those two colors, uh, curves like this would be essentially flat. You know, that, that, that would mean that you get a treatment that no one ever has a disease come back. So if you had a perfect treatment, the curve would be flat. The worst treatments, the curves would be straight going down. So in this case, what you see is the, the, the higher up the curve is, the better it is. And you can see in, in this particular example, the blue curve, which is on top, represents the three drugs. So this was important. We were really thrilled to see these results because uh, you know they, they really showed an improvement over what we could do in the past. Now, 
one of the important things and a frequent questions we get from, uh, uh, from our patients too, is like, well, you know, this is, um, interesting. I'm glad you're telling me this treatment works, but I'm really about quality of life. And I'll tell you something in multiple myeloma, quality of life and quantity of life, if treated properly, go hand in hand. That is with the treatments that we have, that we can significantly control your disease. If you can do that, you can control the disease and you see the proteins come down and the M protein come down and all of those things. That usually also translates into improvement in symptoms, what globally we would call the quality of life. Now, in this study, what you see there, uh, and, and you know, it, it, there's several graphs that just show that patients that are getting the better treatment have better quality of life. So sometimes people will say, oh, I don't know if I want to do this. You know, what would you do if this was your family member, you know, your, your, your mother, your father? And I always say, it's, if, if you're in doubt, it's worth considering trying, because I know that if this works as I expect it will work, it can significantly improve your symptoms. So that was one trial. That's, this is another trial that was uh, recently uh, published and has been presented, which is called the Apollo trial. Now, this is just like the first one I showed you. It's a phase three study. So again, head-to-head -head comparison. This is for patients who have myeloma that is coming back. The purple box represents the experimental arm. So that is the artumumab, the pomalutamide or pomalist and dexamethasone. And in the bottom part, you have just pomalist and dexamethasone as treatment for the disease. This is for patients who have their disease coming back and that need uh, additional uh, treatment uh, for, for its control. Now, this is, this is the, are the curves for that study. Again, you see the purple one, it's the experimental treatment. So remember, the higher the curve, the better. So it is better. It's better to get three drugs and two drugs. And we can see a clear distinction between both of those two uh, treatments. Now, um, so we're happy because this gives us now a second option of what we're thinking for the treatment of relapse. I told you about the DARA, Revlimid, and dexamethasone. This is the DARA, Pomalist, and dexamethasone. Now, in, in this particular uh, trial, the one thing, I, I won't get too much into the technicalities, but we see that the duration, the number of months until we get to that midpoint for those curves, it's a little bit shorter than what I showed you before with the previous study. And you might say, oh, you know, wait a minute, the results appear to be better with the Pollock study, which is the one I showed you before. Now, the, the, the reality is these are different patient populations. So one of the things we'll learn in uh, medical school and our training, you really can't take two studies and compare them. I say, oh, based on just this indirect comparison, um, I'm going to conclude that A is better than B and so forth. But the one thing we know is that one of the, one of the challenges is when we are running the more recent studies, um, um, a lot of our patients are, you know, previously being, have been previously been exposed to long duration of treatment with, uh, with lenalidomide, the relevant post-transplant like maintenance. So maybe some of the similar drugs like pomalis don't have the same punch, at least not the first time you use them again. And I'll talk to you more about that. Now there's another trial that the third one you need to be aware of, which is called the CANDOR clinical trial. This CANDOR trial looks at uh, uh, three drug versus two again. But in this case, instead of looking at combinations of the, you know, the thalidomide family of drugs, now the comparison is daratumumab, carfilzomib, or kyprolis and dexamethasone versus the carfilzomib or kyprolis and dexamethasone. Another phase three study. Uh, so, you know, in this particular uh, clinical trial, once more, they're looking at what we call progression-free survival. So for how long can you control the disease before you need to go to the next line of therapy? And this is a curve. Um, this curve, uh, again, the red shows the experimental treatment. The blue is a control arm. So three drugs, again, better than two drugs. And remember, after I show you these three studies, I've already told you that you have to use the best treatments up front because down the line, it may get complicated or a person may not want to get additional treatment. And what we show here, and I won't go into all the technicalities, is not only that there's a big difference between those curves, but now it turns out that the midpoint of this curve is actually farther out than it was in the previous study that I showed you. So this is slowly moving us into the following thought process. For patients who have myeloma, who have completed the first line of treatment, whether that included a transplant or not, I think more and more people are thinking that combinations that include the dartumumab or isotoximab, as I'm going to show you next, plus carfilzomib, 
may be of particular interest for patients. This is for the first time the disease comes back, and we're going to talk more about other options. Uh, I'm going to go through this uh, in the interest of time. There's another study. So I told you Candor was the first one that used the, the Kyprolis. The second study, we, we, you know, we call Ikema. And Ikema is the same as three drugs versus two. Now, the change here, instead of the daratumumab, uh, the, the study team used uh, isatoximab, which is commercially known. You may have seen this in your treatment centers as Sarclisa. So it's three drugs versus two. And by now, you're experts at looking at these curves. And what you see there is that once more, there is a significant difference in favor of the, the, the three drugs. So we, we see that this is, this is uh, uh, perhaps further evidence that as we go forward, uh, we're going to use this more and more for that first uh, episode of relapse. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to leave it at that. This is the first part of the relapse. I'm going to show you a few slides of what happens if after doing that, the disease comes back and one needs to think about the next line of treatment. So there's a few options there. Uh, one of them is, um, is an antibody that we call Belantamav Mafadotin. In short, the commercial name is called Blenrep. This is an antibody that targets this BCMA. <clears throat> Sorry, you're going to see BCMA mentioned many times. BCMA is just an anchor that exists in the myeloma cells. So it's something that, you know, it's, it's somewhat specific to, to myeloma cells and related cells. So if, if you can find something that goes and latches onto that, whatever you're delivering there, you know, it, it's good. It's very, very targeted. So people develop these antibodies that uh, go and latch there to that BCMA. Um, and then the antibodies actually are a little bit like a Trojan horse. They have a small molecule of a chemical uh, material that is very toxic to cells, any cell in the body. But if you can deliver it only to the cells that express as BCMA that have that anchor, then you can get pretty good results. And that's, that's what the, the balantamab mafodotin is. It is uh, one of the most powerful treatments we have. It is a treatment that we're working through how to best administer it because it has a toxicity uh, that, that is problematic. And that is uh, there's irritation of the front part of the eye, something we call uh, a keratopathy, which can interfere sometimes with you know, visual acuity, can make someone have discomfort with lights, what we call photophobia. Um, this, uh, it's important to mention, this is not something that is a permanent that will make you go blind, but it's uncomfortable when you have that symptom. So sometimes we have to stop treatment and the FDA required that this drug be administered in conjunction with an eye professional. So um, it's, it's one of the opportunities we have for treatment. Another one if, that we have for further, uh, 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 you know, down the line would be the, the uh, Selinexor. Selinexor, which comes in a pill form. Some of you may have known this, it's called Expovio. It's treated, uh, you know, it's used to treat myeloma that is advanced. This is one such clinical trial, the Boston clinical trial. Uh, the experimental arm in orange is uh, in combination with bortezomib or velcid and dexamethasone versus bortezomib and dexamethasone. And once more, the curve shows that uh, selling extra does contribute to better outcomes. Now, this drug is being explored in different combinations and different schedules. When it was first approved, it was given twice per week and at doses that were really tough on patients. So, so few patients wanted to continue taking this medication if they ran into the side effects. Now we use it in a much different way, once a week with effective uh, preventive medicines. And in my experience, it's actually much better tolerated than we, you know, what we had in the past. Not always, and there's some patients that can do that, but it's an option for the treatment. So that's, that's another one uh, you know, that, that uh, we, are, we are working with. There's another drug that uh, you should know that it's called the Venetoplax or Venclexta. This drug is available for the treatment of other uh, forms of uh, blood cancers, particularly leukemias. But it turns out that there's a subset of myeloma patients who have this genetic marker, which is a translocation 1114. This is an abnormal uh, fusion between chromosomes 11 and 14, who seem to do particularly well. Now you see the curves there on the left side. The green curve is that of, of patients being treated with Venetoplax. And the results are really, uh, you know, uh, outstanding. Now, there were some, some problems with this particular clinical trial. I won't go into all the details. I think part of the problem was that they treated all patients instead of just focusing on those that have that genetic marker. Um, in fact, if, if some of you have access to your records, you can look and see if you have that. 
because I, I tell my colleagues, for me, it's kind of like an Easter egg. If you may, if I'm doing a second opinion, I'm reviewing medical records and I find that the patient has this abnormality, I know that immediately opens up new options for me for treatment. And this uh, venetoclax can also be combined uh, with things like uh, the daratumumab. Um, this is what we call in medicine a, water flow, a waterfall or a cascade plot. So the ideal plot would be a perfect square because that means on every patient, the drop of the monoclonal protein was 100%. And I would suggest to you that what you see there on the left side in green is almost a perfect square, meaning the majority of patients who had this abnormality, this 1114, who were treated with this combination ended up uh, uh, responding to the, to the treatment. So that was very, very exciting. So a few other comments about uh, BCMA. BCMA, I told you about this antibody that you see here on, on, the, on, the, on the graph on the right side, uh, that you, know, you can have this uh, combined with a chemical agent. But people figure out too that, well, if that's such a great anchor, maybe we, we can find ways by which we can send the immune system and fight off the myeloma cells. And that is what has been done with CAR T cells and with bispecific antibodies. The CAR T cells, just, just a quick word on that. Uh, these are cells that are produced from your own white cells, the white cells that you have in your bloodstream. Uh, we collect those cells, and amongst those cells, there's some that are called lymphocytes. And the most common form of lymphocytes in the blood are called T lymphocytes. So you have those, those, you know, those lymphocytes there in the blood. Uh, T cells are like bullies. They just don't know who to attack, but they're, they're mean. T cells are meant to be mean against things that shouldn't be there. And they help us fight tumors and fight, you know, other things like infections. So people figure out, well, what if we actually have this uh, T cells develop an appetite for myeloma cells? And what they did is they developed a matching anchor to that BCMA. So the cells are sent to a facility where they're processed. They know back to latch on into the myeloma cells. And once they're infused and they're given back into the, into the you know, bloodstream, like a transfusion, they immediately go and start harassing those myeloma cells. And that's good. We want them to do that because they kill myeloma cells. So these T cells like doing their job, like to do it well, but don't know where to go. But it's, they're helped when they're given this target to go against BCMA. And this led to the approval of the first CAR T cell, which is available for the treatment of myeloma since uh, March of last year. This is the IDASL product. So Dr. Munshi, I'm just showing you the cover of the, the publication for that. Now I'm going to show you a different graph here. So this bar graph shows the fraction of patients that respond to an intervention. And the patients that went into this clinical trial that Dr. Munshi had run, uh, many of them had extensive prior treatment. They had seen all the drugs I mentioned before. And still, as you can see, you know, over 80% of them were responding to this. So, so we're, we're excited. We still are in the ABCs. We have a lot to learn about CAR T cells and how to best use them. And I'm sure there's going to be a second, a third, and a fourth generation of this. But the reality is we have one more option that wouldn't be represented in my box diagram that I showed you at the beginning. So, that, so that's important. Uh, there's another one, which uh, you, you probably have heard about this, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of interest in, which is called a Silta cell. This is a similar product. It's a, a CAR T cell product, uh, which is produced by uh, uh, Janssen. And what, what they were able to report, Dr. Martin reported at uh, the last American Society of Hematology meeting, was that um, you know, they have the majority of patients, close to 100% of them respond most of those responses were very deep. And uh, what we know as well, too, is that these responses are actually quite durable. Um, you look at, at the curves, I'm going to put both of them here. You know, when you look at uh, those patients that are doing, you know, the, the best in this clinical trials, they're, they're represented by the orange and the light blue curve. So we have good results, especially if you start measuring all those things with uh, minimal residual disease. So it's, it's um, you know, it's, it's been quite encouraging to see this. Now, I, I should, I should um, caution the audience, and this is something that is, is important for every, everyone to know. There's a couple of things. These treatments are not without side effects. And, you know, we have seen some uh, significant toxicities, uh, uh, which can go from this very intense inflammatory um, status that we call CRS or cytokine release syndrome, which is when our body just goes in overdrive and inflammation. And, you know, we want a little of that, but if you get too much of that, that can be harmful to the person. So, and sometimes we also see some toxicity in the nervous system. 
And it can go from, from, you know, mild things like, you know, sometimes difficulty finding words or, or writing to the more extreme ones. So we we're very excited, but we are concerned. So that would be, that would be number one, that we need to know exactly how to use them. Things are getting better. The medical teams that do this know how to do this better. Uh, I think it's a great option for patients, but you need to know what you're doing. The second comment, and this is this is a sovereign one, because of the capacity of how much this is uh, this can be produced, there are very significant limitations of how many patients we can treat right now. Even at specialized centers, we don't have the full access that 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 we would like to. I know the the companies and the FDA are working on making more of this available, uh, but unfortunately, for the time being, uh, we don't have enough production capacity for this, for this T cells. And I know we've, we've been pretty vocal about this and we're hoping this is a temporary thing, but, but nevertheless, for the time being remains a major limitation for, uh, for our, our patients. To finish off, I want to put in a word for something that I call the bispecific antibodies. The bispecifics are uh, antibodies that uh, have been developed to be like um, soluble CAR T cells, if you may. So I told you this, this, this T cells we send outside and then they come back happy into the body and they have this thing that matches to the myeloma cells, so that be CMA. And then someone thought, well, that's good and well, but it's going to take you three weeks. What if, what if I could develop a molecule that actually does the same thing, like a matchmaker molecule? And that's what the bispecific antibodies are. So the antibodies usually have like two arms, like I'm putting with my hands here. So they made this arm latch onto the myeloma cell and this arm latches onto the T cell and it brings them together. Um, mm. and I, I always think like that, like, you know, there's like a double-sided Velcro. Uh, but the beauty of this is this is off the shelf. So we don't have to wait for any production. You know, I could see a patient just now and say, yes, I want to use a bispecific, write my treatment. And in a few hours, the patient could be getting that. Now, I won't go through the list. I'm going to show you that, you know, there's, there's a number of them in clinical trials. This list came out from the last American Society of Hematology meeting uh, with very high rates of response, as you can see on those percentages on the right side. So there's no question they're going to be here to stay. But there's one more important point. There's two of them that I separated at the bottom part. And you see that they don't have that BCMA comment. And that is because they have a different target. They have a different anchor. So there's one that is called talketamab, which targets uh, this other molecule, which is and, you know, uh, somewhat exclusive to myeloma, although it seems to be expressed as well to inher follicles, which is, uh, in fact, is misspelled as a GPRC5D. Um, and and the, the next one, which is called sevostimab, which targets this other molecule, FCRH5, which is also a target that seems to be somewhat exclusive for uh, multiple myeloma. So I think, I hope with that, I can give you a, a broad overview of what we are doing for the treatment of, of myeloma. When I use my slide with those boxes and I provide time, I say that there are, there are two important things of those times that I showed. Number one is that things continue to get better and things um, have improved substantially since I started practicing in this particular field. So there's just that intrinsic value of knowing that we have better treatments. But it's often underappreciated that during that period of time that we have the ability to control the disease now for, uh, for years, that allows for the research and the clinical development that I mentioned to bring those solutions to the clinic. So for patients who are seeing, for instance, now treatment for relapse, we sometimes will see patients that got treatments that today we would say, boy, that's not the best way to treat that person. We have so many better ways of doing it five years later. Or for patients who have received good treatments, but unfortunately experience a relapse, those are the patients that now are receiving some of the CAR T cells. So that is what the economists call the value of options, because you offer options that did not exist at the time when you started on treatment. So um, um, thank you again, Kelly. I'm just, this, this is a slide I often use. Uh, the one on the left is a uh, first myeloma patient that was ever published. This was before there were privacy laws, so everyone knew, knows her name. And, you know, but in the 1800s, I mean, she wouldn't have had a different prognosis if she had been born in ancient Greece. So, I, you know, we've seen just tremendous progress in the last several years. And, um, you know, on the right side, a picture from a, a patient of mine he allows me to use from a Christmas card. And this, I think this kid is now in college uh, who <laughs> continues to do very well uh, because of the options that have been afforded because of all of this research. So um, thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be with you all here today. Well, thank you, Rafael. Doesn't that make you feel older that the kids in college?
Yes, of course. <laughs> I you believe it. You. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, listen, let's get a couple questions in here. Everyone's on. Um, I'm looking at the chat right now. Let's see here. Does everyone see the chat right now? Are they signed on to the chat? Uh, we can see it. Yeah. All right. So let's, let's start with one of the first questions. Please define, discuss biochemical relapse. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So but when we talk about biochemical relapse in medical terms, that means that we can find the proteins uh, coming up, their, their concentration is rising, but we don't see yet that the person has symptoms or that there is anemia or there's a new bone lesion. So it just means that we have, if uh, you know, a way to describe it, like we have the pull revere of what may be happening. Now, we don't know how long that's going to take. Sometimes we have patients who have biochemical relapse and could stay with very slow increases over a matter of several years. And then we have patients where we see that, and that's the first sign that then more things will come and we have to pay attention. So we pay a lot of attention to this, what is called the biochemical relapse. Great. Uh, Sid, I, I'd like you to take this question from uh, one of our attendees. What is the difference between multiple myeloma and plasma cytoma? How do you treat both of, blood, of the blood cancers? Thank you. Um, thank you, George. Uh, this is, you know, I think we sometimes make our lives oh. more complicated than they need to be in medicine. When we talk about myeloma and plasma cytomas, we're talking about the same cells, just how they present themselves. So myeloma, it's in the bone marrow, plasma cytoma is just pretty much a lump of those cells together. So they, they form something we can see as a mass. And if it is not located in the bone marrow, we call it extra medullary. So that's what an extra medullary plasma cytoma is. Another term that's confusing, which is plasma cell leukemia, which is the same thing. It's the same plasma cells, except that they are floating in the bloodstream. Normally the myeloma cells are not present in large numbers in the bloodstream, but sometimes they do. And that's what we call plasma cell leukemia. Now, each one of this has some implications for how we think about disease aggressiveness and the, the treatments we might use. But at the end of the day are just different forms in which the myeloma presents itself. Great. Uh, Sid, let me direct this one to you. There's two questions. After a stem, stem cell transplant is done, will I lose immunity provided by prior vaccines I have taken in previous years? Um, that's a good question. And um, as you know, this, I will be talking about stem cell transplantation yes. a little more details during my talk. It basically is going to ablate the entire bone marrow and start fresh. So um, it's not necessarily that you lose all immunity, but definitely the previous antibody and the memory cells, they do go down. So the CDC and the transplant community and the Infectious Disease Society, all of them have come together and actually we have formatted a specific protocol of revaccination after stem cell transplantation which usually starts after um, the counts have recovered between four to six months and there is a standard set timing of which vaccines we should be using so the answer is yes you do need to get revaccinated on most of the vaccines that you had received in the past I see. And we have a, um, another question from him. We are not able to do anything to understand clinical trials of myeloma treatments, but sign, but sign all these papers. You just want to have your diagnosis, plamocytoma, pancreas to be cured. So apparently he's got some additional things going on here. Uh, told us he is not myeloma specialist to cure finding a 20. Okay. So here, this is the main thing here. I might just comment on this. We suggest at the IMF that you see a myeloma specialist. Doctors, do you agree with that? Uh, a general yes. pra yeah. A general practitioner might be able to help you with some of the basic things of it, but you don't want him turning to page 27 and not knowing what he's doing. It's very, very important that you get a myeloma specialist. And to concur with that, you get a myeloma specialist nurse because they all communicate with the doctors and can offer another aspect of that. Let me get one more question out here. Is bite the same as the bispecific antibody treatment you mentioned? If not, can you discuss what this is? Yeah, I can, I can take that one. So uh, they are the same functionally, but bite is a, as a specific uh, name that's trademarked uh, by Amgen and it's a slightly different molecule. It's a little bit smaller. 
but they do the same thing. They're just locks that bring things together. But the, the Byte is a specific trademark name for, for Amgen products that are slightly different. I have one other question that popped up here, and both of you might have different opinion here. Is one bone marrow biopsy a year sufficient if you're in treatment? Um, so maybe I can start and pass it back to Sid, but it, it all depends. Uh, sometimes if you're in treatment and you're, you know, you're doing great, yes, you might need one a year. I think I, I usually do at least one a year, especially now that we're measuring MRD for the very good responders. Sometimes you need more than that. But also as you, as you get away from the first phase of treatment and you, and you know, if you're doing very well, you can actually space them out and don't even necessarily have to do them once a year. So unfortunately the answer is it depends. Yeah, I conquer, um, especially if the myeloma markers, the blood, the free light chain and the immunofixations, all those that are um, uh, pretty stable and no sign of any progression, then you can definitely space them out a little bit. But for the MRD measurement, at least one to two years would be recommended. Are both of you really using a lot at, uh, in the aspect of MRD for your current patients? Yeah, maybe. Um, I, I'm sorry, it was a little cough there. So I do use them. I use MRD measurement routinely. I do that in patients who complete the first phase of treatment, and Sid will tell us more about that, just to gauge what to do next, um, uh, with the intention of really trying to get rid of as many of those cells as we can safely. That's very important. Uh, but also, as, as, as we're pondering on the duration of treatment, with uh, particularly in maintenance, patients who are in complete responses. I bring it into the conversation as one more piece of information as we try to make those decisions. So pretty routinely, uh, 10 to the minus six, we use the next generation sequencing. So oh, that's great, Sid. So continuation of that is, you know, there are questions that are often asked, how long to continue the maintenance? And there have been uh, uh, mm -hmm. some signs that if you have persistent MRD negativity, at least for several years, then one can get into the discussion, should we have a maintenance-free holiday, knowing that you still need to get monitored like a hawk, because some patients can come out of the MRD negative box. And that also I'll be discussing during my talk. Oh, great, great. Um, from another attendee, I am experiencing mild shortness of breath while on Kyprolis. Will it go away when I stop Kyprolis? Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, you know, uh, it's only concerning if it's severe shortness of breath uh, because there's a small fraction of patients where, you know, you can have cardiac uh, um, abnormalities as a consequence of this in the form of weakening of the pumping ability of the heart. Uh, but a lot of people can have mild symptoms. Some of this sometimes also related to the hydration that comes with a kyprolis. And, and some of this is uh, not completely understood, but for the most part it is. But if you've talked to your doctor and your doctor has assessed you and things are okay, it's usually not something that is of, of major concern, although it's uncomfortable, of course. Yeah. Um, when my on oncologist is stumped, about my symptoms. Where do I go for help? How often do I see tendinitis as a side effect of the EMEDs as well? So it's a two point question. Um, I've heard this from other patients out there that they go, well, my doctor doesn't know what to do and he's just let me go, which is something that as a uh, facilitator and a helper of my loan patients just drives me bananas. Say that they're in, uh, in Los Angeles, we have several institutions that they can go to. Um, now I heard this, the city of hope is opening up. I'm saying this for the patient city of hope has a, an office in Newport beach and Duarte where they work a lot on stem cell transplants. You also have institutions in San Francisco that have interest in helping you through your process. That would be uh, UCSF. Now, what do you do when a patient comes to you and says, I'm deep into this, my doctor didn't handle it. How do you analyze what's happening there? Yeah, we, we see this with, you know, with some frequency. I think it goes back to your point. If at all possible, at least in an, uh, at some points in the course, it's good to have engagement of a myeloma team of excellence. I, I would say this is not self-serving. This is just so complicated. Myeloma is 2% of cancers. Uh, the three of us cannot keep up with what's going on in the literature. We try, we read, we get these emails. 
And if you, if, if it's hard to do that for one tumor type, how can you do that for all tumor types? So I think it's important because there might be things that are slightly different that we would do in a different way that may be either more effective or safer just because, you know, we're in the field <clears throat> that may not be available otherwise. So I think it's important for people to, to, to know that. Unfortunately, there's, you know, there's not the centers everywhere, but now with telemedicine, you know, people can actually have access to centers remotely. I, I hope that the genie will not go back into the bottle that we will have telemedicine as an option forever. Uh, but that's kind of where we are. Okay. COVID. You guys have been dealing with that and who knows what's coming up around the corner, but one person said, I'm a high risk factor in MM. I've been infected by COVID-19. What's next? Sid, do you want to start? Uh, yes. Uh, so if somebody has um, multiple myeloma, they by the definition, they are at a high risk um, for uh, COVID-related complications. Now, if somebody already had COVID, um, uh, then uh, it's uh, not necessary that you would not get COVID again. So precautions are very important. Vaccination and boosters are still recommended. We had been given a few shell to many of our patients. So I'd like to see what Dr. Fonseca and Dr. Richard's um, team are doing for Evushel for their patients. I mean, we do that for stem cell transplantation prerequisite, but otherwise, even non-transplant patients, are you offering that to um, your patients prophylactically? Uh, Dr. Richards, you want to start? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so at our institution, um, if you um, have a hemolignancy malignancy um, or have had prior transplant, you basically can get a view shield now. Um, they, and so particularly patients who are on monoclonal antibodies or on VTK inhibitors, if they have like CLL or Waldenstrom's, um, but we are offering it to our patients. So again, yeah. going back to the same point that one should talk to a myeloma specialist and myeloma centered treatment that actually is a multidisciplinary, not only physicians or nurses, but we also have experienced pharmacists and um, uh, patient advocates. So it's a team that is built around this single disease that definitely is there to help our patients and uh, caregivers. And, and, you know, this would be another great example of why the myeloma team needs to be sort of involved. Because if you say, well, myeloma, you know, and I'm concerned about COVID, of course it's concerning, but does it matter if you have smoldering or MGOS? For what we know, uh, people develop good responses to the vaccination, so it's probably less concerning. Now, if you're on treatment, it's more concerning, but then it does depend on the treatment. Um, it turns out, for instance, that if people are taking Revlimin, there's two studies that are published on this your response to vaccinations is better than if you're off any treatment because of the immune effects that it has. So that has been published in the past. So if someone tells me, you know, I'm, you know, I'm taking maintenance treatment with Len, uh, it, just keep taking it as you get your vaccination. So that's important. The other one is uh, there's recent data that with the boosters, even for patients with hemolignancies, you can elicit responses. So I think that's, that's very good news. And my two colleagues mentioned, I just want to expand a little bit on this Evusheld. So Evusheld is an FDA-approved product that is the antibodies themselves against COVID that you just inject them. So, so your body doesn't even have to mount a reaction or a response like with a vaccine, but it's just, you just inject them and they're in the person's body. It's like given the IVIG that some of you may be getting and it protects the, the patients for about six months. So I think there's many good options now for myeloma patients. And I think there should be um, less reason for more myeloma specific concern now of COVID and especially if you do those things. Oh, I just got one more question I want to get out. Does the COVID vaccine impact your M protein? That's a great question. I'll take a first stab at that. I think it can do so, but transiently. And, and I've seen that in a few patients. Um, I, I, you know, there's, there's a few patients that have progressed and then, but then they, they think it may be linked to that. I don't, I don't know. It's, I guess it's, it's possible from the early phases. I, I don't, you know, I, I don't think it's, it's impossible to say that couldn't happen. I don't think it's common though, but I have seen a few patients that have had a transient rise in, in their proteins. And I'm interested in the opinions of my colleagues as well too. I don't think that 
from what I have seen is a reason not to get the vaccine. I think, I think the, the benefits in my mind far outweigh the risks. And the other thing is as we do PET scans, we can tell you which arm you got the vaccination. It's kind of interesting because the radiologists will say, Oh, the lymph nodes on the left armpit are, you know, showing the reaction. And that's just because that's where the immune system is doing what it's supposed to be doing. So, but again, I'm interested in hearing the opinion of my colleagues too. Uh, that is yeah. correct. So, so, so the immune activation is real. Um, not only just the left axillary lymphadenopathy. I have seen left cervical and sometimes even generalized, depending on patients to patients. But most of them are transient. Most of them would go away. And I do not um, believe that vaccination will anyway impact negatively the outcome of multiple myeloma or the natural history. So there may be biomarkers that may transiently rise, but the myeloma itself is not going to get worse by vaccination. Tiffany? Yeah, I would say the same thing. I would say, you know, whenever we have a patient who's had recent vaccinations and we see like the light chains go up or the M protein go up a little bit, we always give it just a little bit more time to see what's happening. And a lot of times so it'll go right back down to where they were at a baseline. So it's usually, it's transient. Thank you, Tiffany, Raphael, and Sid for helping me out here on this one. Raphael, thanks for getting your schedule adjusted to help us out this morning. Oh, thank you. For and with that, oh, I'm sorry. And with that, we're going to take a little break here. Why don't you stand up and stretch, go get yourself a cup of coffee for those that drink coffee or those that drink scotch for breakfast. Just try to wait till about 12 o'clock. <laughs> thanks everyone. We'll be right back. Thank you. Thank you. IMF, it's a full body experience. We do believe a lot in meditation and mindfulness. And Kelly Sidorowitz has set up that program. She's licensed to do so in these things. And that five minutes, you know, I do it myself while we're doing it. It helps me relax and not sound so silly. And I think that it's important that you find something like that on a daily basis while you're traveling through this journey. And, you know, as they always say, it's marathon, not a sprint. And in marathons, meditation is very important. Well, my next guest, which I'm thrilled to introduce, is Dr. Sid Ganguly. And he has been, well, Sid, I think we've been going back seven, eight years now. And we started, I met him at an RCW that was live in Kansas. And ever since then, he's always been on the poster boy to come to these speaking things. And I really appreciate Sid. So take it away with My Loma 101. Thank you, um, Kelly. And uh, thanks, IMF, for um, giving me the opportunity of coming in front of this audience. And as, uh, let me see if it is working. Okay. Okay, here we go. All right. Um, so, as Kelly has uh, said, I was in Kansas City for almost 20 years doing myeloma. Recently, I moved to Houston and building the myeloma program here. And it is my honor to come and present because of some um, scheduling changes. Um, we are presenting the myeloma. 101 and frontline therapy after we had talked about relapsed refractory settings. So uh, many of you and the caregivers may have some questions regarding myeloma, the disease itself, and hopefully after this talk and through the panel discussion, we'll be able to answer some of your questions. So without any further ado, we will go ahead and start my first slide. So some of these, um, um, Initial slides may be uh, basic for someone who had been dealing with myeloma for some time, but there may be some who had just been diagnosed with myeloma. And for them, we must state that multiple myeloma is a cancer of our immune system. The name of the cancer cell is called plasma cell. We all have plasma cells. And as you can see on the right upper panel, uh, those uh, blue uh, color uh, cells, those are the malignant plasma cells. Normal plasma cells make normal antibodies that fights off infection or any foreign tissues. But for some reason, if the plasma cells become abnormal and they start proliferating inside the bone marrow and start making abnormal protein, as you can see on the left upper panel, the test is called serum protein electrophoresis, and the second spike is called an M protein or monoclonal protein. That means one group of 
plasma cells, a monoclonal group of plasma cells, which are malignant plasma cells making this M protein. And at the bottom, it could be a full immunoglobulin, or this also could be the free light chains, which is a part of the immunoglobulin. And as those plasma cells expand inside the bone marrow, it can cause fractures, lytic lesions, and eat away the bones, releasing calcium in the blood, and hence the term called CRAB that actually identifies a patient with symptomatic myeloma. C stands for hypercalcemia, R when the kidneys, the renal involvement, A when the bone marrow is overcrowded by the plasma cells causing anemia, and B for the bone lesions. And that's when we call it a symptomatic myeloma. Majority of patients with multiple myeloma actually starts off with a relatively benign condition called monoclonal gammopathy of unknown significance, aka MGUS. Now, MGUS is not uncommon, especially as we get older. In the general population above the age of 55 or 60, 5%, that means almost one in 20 people can walk around with this monoclonal protein that may not progress and may not cause any clinical significance and hence the name unknown significance. Now in certain percentage of patients, the monoclonal gammopathy can progress with increasing malignant plasma cells inside the bone marrow. And by our group, we have said if it is more than 10%, it's still asymptomatic, but now it has progressed to one step further called smoldering myeloma. And even at this stage, patients are asymptomatic and often under observation. And because of many reasons that we are still yet to discover and many genetic changes and chromosomal changes, these patients develop those symptoms called CRAB or symptomatic multiple myeloma that requires intervention and treatment. Now, as we discussed earlier with Dr. Fonseca's presentation, that some of these patients with multiple myeloma, where the plasma cells do not adhere to each other or stay inside the bone marrow where they are supposed to, they leave the bone marrow, go other places, become more loose, and that could mean more virulent, more aggressive, and hence develop extra medullary myeloma or even circulating in the blood when it is plasma cell leukemia, which is a very aggressive form of multiple myeloma. So the question always remained, monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, how common is it? And I said that around 5% in the general population. But in the Previous surveys, most of them done in the Western world, you can imagine it is very difficult to perform a truly population survey, especially in a country like United States. But Iceland showed us how it can be done because this is very homogeneous. They sent out invitation letters to almost 150,000 of their population above the age of 40, inviting them to give blood sample to see if they have monoclonal gammopathy or not. Almost 75,000 normal volunteers offered to take part in this survey, and they underwent this, what we call is now I stop multiple myeloma or Icelandic study. They found out around, as we suspected, 5% of the general population has monoclonal gammopathy of unknown significance. Interestingly, after that, Iceland, they followed those patients in three different ways. One, patients were just not followed. They follow up with their primary physician. Second group were followed by guidelines. And the third group were followed very intensely by annual monitoring, sometimes bone marrow and x-rays and CT scans. And they found out that patients which are actually followed more intensely 
have more progression identified by either smoldering myeloma or other forms of blood cancers like lymphomas. So this is very intriguing that patients with monoclonal gammopathy, if they are followed intensively, some of the patients can be found to develop other cancers. But does it mean that we should start doing that for all our general population? The authors were very clear that until and unless we say that this intensive screening changes something, either it involves more symptomatic patients or improves survival or patients' quality of life, they do recommend against general population screening. So this is the beginning of the I stop multiple myeloma study, and we'll be hearing more in future. As a part of that study, they also found out smoldering multiple myeloma is around 0.5% of the population 40 years of age or older. But who are the people that are higher chance of developing monoclonal gammopathy? Now, we have noted two distinct populations. African Americans have a higher incidence and prevalence of multiple myeloma and monoclonal gammopathy. And the question also belonged, if I have multiple myeloma, would my children or my first degree relatives have a higher chance of developing multiple myeloma or monoclonal gammopathy? This PROMISE study that was presented last year's American Society of Hematology. This was conducted by Dana Farber and Associated Institutes. They used high-risk population survey and mass general biobank. And by showing that, by doing it, they found out that in general population, monoclonal gammopathy is seen as above 50-year-old around three to 4% of the population. But in patients that are higher risk, African-American or first degree relatives, the incidence could be even double. And this is done by our standard serum protein electrophoresis or immunofixation. There is an ultra sensitive method called mass spectrometry. And if we use that particular technology, the incidence of monoclonal gammopathy could be as high as 13%. So yes, if somebody has a first degree relative with a history of multiple myeloma or monoclonal gammopathy, they do have increased chance and hence it may not be a bad idea to inform that to a primary care physician. Now, when the patients develop multiple myeloma, as I said, that now have time come for the treatment. I remember when I was in medical school, a diagnosis of multiple myeloma was universally fatal. In 1970s and early 80s, an average survival for multiple myeloma was in the range of 2.5 to 3 years. But as the science advanced and technology advanced, in these days, it's not unusual for me to see a patient that I had seen 20 years ago, as Raphael was saying, that the, ch the child is now in college and the patient is still you know, living a fully functional life, but still under care of a myeloma team. So the survival in multiple myeloma has definitely improved over the last several decades. And the, because the, the reason for that inf uh, improvement is because of advances in the chemotherapy, the transplantation, all the new drugs that Dr. Fonseca has mentioned, and most recently, the cellular immunotherapy, CAR-T, bispecific, and all the other targeted therapies. So the treatment of multiple myeloma, and Kelly had heard me saying that many times, and also I have given many lectures that it it really is like a lawn care. And whenever I say that in my office to a patient who is first time seeing me, eyebrows are raised. So let's just take a pause and try to make an analogy of our body with our backyard or a lawn. Say, for example, five to six years ago, if the gentleman or the patient did not have 
multiple myeloma and had a fantastic green lawn. Now the bone marrow has a lot of plasma cells and the backyard is now full of wheat. And now we have a full blown multiple myeloma. So it goes to the myeloma specialist and the physician discusses chemotherapy, usually a combination treatment, which once taken clearly would be effective in killing those plasma cells. So if I make an analogy of the chemotherapy that is used with an intention to induce remission, hence it is called induction treatment to induce remission, can I not say that I'm using the same analogy to kill my weed using a weed killer? So after four to six such cycles of chemotherapy of induction, my bone marrow should be looking better. But still, knowing multiple myeloma is a relatively incurable cancer, the roots, the genes, the chromosome abnormalities may still be present under the surface, and hence the backyard still has few dandelions left behind, even if I am nearing remission. The next phase is to get rid of the residual plasma cells or the weed. We call it lawn renovation. So far, we have been doing the weed killing. Now let's do the lawn renovation. Let's re-sod the lawn, which is in a transplant eligible patient. I would use the word bone marrow transplantation or stem cell transplantation after the initial four to six cycles of induction chemotherapy. So in that situation, we collect the stem cells from the individual, freeze it, give high-dose chemotherapy, basically nuking the backyard. Now the backyard is barren, the bone marrow is cleared. Now we take the stem cells out from the freezer and put it through the vein, just like a blood transfusion. We reseeded the bone marrow. We reseeded the lawn. It takes around two weeks for those stem cells to grow inside the bone marrow. And after two weeks, once the counts recover, hopefully this will recover without any residual plasma cells. The backyard will be now looking again green, hopefully without the dandelions. But multiple myeloma by definition is incurable. Even if you see the bottom, the tumor burden has gone down, down, down to a very low level, even at the minimal residual disease negative status, there is always a fear it can come back and hence the concept of the maintenance. Hence, there are phases of the treatment of multiple myeloma starting from induction in a transplant eligible patient stem cell transplantation followed by maintenance. So question is, how do we get to the initial induction phase? Excuse me. So the induction we had talked about, could it be two drugs, three drugs or four drugs? You heard about the monoclonal antibody daratumumab. What is the role of transplant and maintenance? Let's discuss that in my subsequent cycles. So this is a Southwest Oncology Group trial. And again, I do not want to overburden with all these numbers. But the bottom line is, this was compared between a three-drug, bortezomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone versus two-drug, lenalidomide and dexamethasone. And one can see that the progression-free survival and the overall survival, both of them were superior when we used the three drug over the two drugs. Diratumumab came in the picture, and which is an antibody against CD38, which is the antigen present on the myeloma cells, and deratumumab directly latches on that protein and kills the myeloma cell. So this particular trial with deratumumab, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone was compared with, again, two drugs of lenalidomide and dexamethasone. But remember, this was in a transplant ineligible patient populations. But even then, one can see that DERA, Revlimid, Dex, it actually fared better than Rev Dex in both the progression-free survival. And there is now a hint that the overall survival also could be superior. So one can see that the triplets 
are better than a doublet. We learned about RVD from the SWAC trial in transplant eligible patients. We learned about DERA Revdex in the Maya trial in transplant ineligible patients. Now we are in 2021, 22. What is the role of a quad treatment? So this brings us to the Griffin trial, which was presented in the last ASH again. So this is deratumumab combined with RVD, which is the standard of care, which was compared with RVD induction, followed by transplant in transplant eligible patients. This is a transplant trial, followed by consolidation and maintenance with deratumumab and Revlimid. So this is a quad DERA RVD. And in that quad, one can see on the left panel, the response rates were far better after the two months of consolidation, transplantation, the CR rate, the complete remission rate is over 80% compared to the RVD, which is around 60%. So the data RVD was better in the response. The MRD negativity rates were also better with data RVD compared to RVD. And now we are seeing that the progression-free survival is improving with the data RVD in the right panel. Now, overall survival is very early to mention anything about the overall survival from the Griffin trial. So MSMART is a publication from the Mayo Clinic that gives guidance to the treatment. And MSPART has already stated that in high-risk patients with multiple myeloma with high-risk chromosomes, a combination of the data VRD is reasonable to try. And now we are looking more and more using of a quad in newly diagnosed patients with multiple myeloma, especially in high-risk patients. This, um, the title is not showing, this is called a first trial. These are patients that are transplant ineligible. And the question was very simple. Is it necessary in a patient who is responding to continue with the treatment or can we stop the treatment after a predefined time? So here one can see that the patients that used the chemo continuously versus uh, stoppage time, say 18 months, their progression-free survival, meaning the relapse rate was far less compared to where they had a predefined treatment period. So my recommendation still would be whether you are doing transplant or not, after the end of the defined treatment of induction consolidation, either continuation of the treatment or maintenance treatment is very important to keep the disease under control. The big question then comes, how about transplantation is necessary? And the answer is, even if there are many, many new medications that are coming out in the treatment of multiple myeloma with a great response rate, great MRD negativity rate, autologous transplantation after induction therapy still remains the standard of care for newly diagnosed patients with multiple myeloma who are transplant eligible. This could be a matter of debate, but the debate is very, very clear with the data that it improves progression-free survival uniformly. So this is the trial from the international French group with compared transplant versus no transplant, and clearly the transplant was superior progression-free survival. Now, yes, of course, the overall survival has not shown any, defect, uh, any advantage yet. One other thing that we learned, that transplantation improves MRD negativity rate, which in turn improves progression-free survival. Now, the question remains, does transplantation improves MRD negativity, but how about the overall survival? This is a trial from the CTN 0702 where we took part and we measured MRD at the end of one year in those patients who underwent transplantation. 
And we saw that if somebody has MRD negativity at the end of one year and the MRD negativity persists, there is a tendency of improving overall survival. So I can go back again what I said, one time snapshot MRD negativity is probably not important, but if somebody is 10 to the power minus six by next gene sequencing MRD negative, and it's persistent at different time points, this definitely has a very good outcome, both in the PFS and maybe also in the overall survival. So MRD negativity attainment is quite important as an end goal for the treatment of multiple myeloma. One other question is often asked, my doctor told me my myeloma is in good remission. Should I go for transplant now or should I harvest my stem cells, continue chemotherapy, consider transplant only when the disease progresses? The answer to that question from me, and I can also speak on behalf of Dr. Fonseca and all the others, the answer is a big no. If you are transplant eligible and if you're in good remission, continued four to six cycles of induction therapy, this is the time to go for the transplant because of multiple reasons that I probably would not be able to explain in one sitting, but this trial showed improved progression-free survival in the IFM. This trial is done recently in United States. This is a very elegant trial which started with the French and now in the United States where patients received RVD and then one group underwent transplantation followed by lenalidomide maintenance. Now in Europe, they stopped the lenalidomide maintenance after one year where in United States, we continued. And the other group, they harvested the stem cells and only transplanted the patients who were on relapse that is called upon late transplant, not an early transplant cohort. And this is the French trial that result is already out. Early transplant fared better with the progression-free survival compared to the late transplant. The big question now would be coming, how about the US group? The US part of the trial has accrued, analyzed, and in May in Chicago in the American Society of Clinical Oncology in one of the leading session called plenary session, that result would be communicated by Dr. Paul Richardson, and we are anxiously awaiting the data. But up until now, this interim analysis demonstrate transplant is not only safe, it improves four-year progression-free survival, and that continues the trend. And even in the era of the new drugs, transplantation remains the standard of care for patients that are transplant eligible. Maintenance. So we talked about the maintenance. The most common maintenance that we do after transplantation is lenalidomide maintenance. We usually start it between day 90 to 100 and in a long-term study, lenalidomide maintenance not only improves progression-free survival, time to next relapse, but also overall survival. And that curve, patients who are on len maintenance continues to separate, meaning len maintenance actually improves life. Now, there have been some controversies on lenalidomide maintenance regarding second primary malignancies, and even taking that into account, LEN maintenance is recommended in majority of the patients post-transplantation. Few words about risk factors of multiple myeloma. So when we first diagnose patients with multiple myeloma, we try to identify what kind of cytogenetic risk factors exist. And based on that, the FISH study cytogenetics, we call it standard risk or high risk. High risks would be deletion 17P, translocation 414, and several others. In high risk patients, this 
fascinating trial from Emory University showed that if we add bortezomib on top of the linalidomide maintenance, it actually improves the survival. It is not a comparative trial, but they showed almost 93% survival after three years in the high-risk patients. So M-Smart, Mayo Clinic, they do recommend if somebody has high-risk cytogenetics, not only lenalidomide maintenance, but also consider adding a proteasome inhibitor like bortezomib on top of the lenalidomide maintenance, so dual or triple maintenance, as a form in high-risk disease. And that's what I practice in my um, uh, practice, where if I have a patient with 17P deletion that underwent transplant, I usually start them on LEN and bortezomib maintenance way before 100 days, maybe by day 70, 80 uh, post-transplantation and monitor them very, very carefully. Now, of course, we are in the deratumumab era, and this trial is now evaluating what is the role of deratumumab maintenance post-transplant. This is accruing. These patients are maintained between lenalidomide and deratumumab compared to only lenalidomide maintenance. And another interesting part of this is trying to answer mm -hmm. if somebody is MRD negative for at least two years, can we randomize them to continue the maintenance or stop maintenance? So this is a very interesting question that will be answered. And MRD is minimal residual disease. A lot of disease exists if you look for it under the iceberg. And as we said, next gene sequencing can identify almost one in a million cells. Sometimes we also do full cytometry to find MRD negativity, which goes up to 10 to the power minus five. So this is another trial, which is trying to answer the question, can we tailor our treatment based on the MRD? This was presented at the ASH and is also published, where data carfilzomib, revlimid, and dex was given as induction, followed by transplant, followed by consolidation, and then at different points, MRD were measured. If somebody was MRD negative in two consecutive sessions, the treatment-free observation box called MRD sure box and surveillance box, they were put and maintained and monitored very, very carefully. And one can see that 84 patients, which is around 70% of the patients achieved MRD sure status and underwent surveillance. And very few patients actually came out even after monitoring for almost one and a half year. However, if you see the curve, patients that are ultra high risk with two or more cytogenetic abnormalities, they do relapse even after MRD negativity. So the question whether if after MRD negativity, we can stop the maintenance or not is probably need to be answered in a different way for patients that are high risk. So the authors concluded that MRD response adapted therapy is feasible. 72% patients can achieve MRD sure status, but high risk patients, we need more trials to answer that question. So one can see that more and more we get towards the MRD negativity, and one can easily see that if you achieve and stay there, you definitely improve the chance of remaining in remission, and hence the time to next therapy or progression-free survival is delayed. So our goal would be to get to an MRD negative status if we can find. And this is going to be my last slide, last before the summary side. This is called a relative risk ratio, where if a general population with general health, their relative risk ratio is 1.0, and if somebody has a very advanced cancer and the physician is giving, an oncologist is giving a chance of survival to be almost half, the relative risk ratio would be 0 0.5, 0 0.4, so pretty dismal. However, as we can see, as we start treating our patients with multiple myeloma with novel treatment, transplant, maintenance, 
we gradually improve the relative risk for survival for our patients and relative survival ratio for our patients with multiple myeloma in 2022 are often seen to be arriving at near general population of 1.0. So my next slide is going to be my summary slide, which I can say, basically continuing what Dr. Fonseca had said, that 15 to 20% of the patients with multiple myeloma may be cured by modern treatment and future may ill more, but we should not stop there. We should keep pushing the envelope and the way to push the envelope is clinical trial. Is quad the new standard of transplant eligible patients? It seems so, at least for the high risk patients. Sustained MRD negativity, not one snap, and hence there was a question, should we do repeat bone marrows down the road? And that will show us if it is sustained or not. Early and upfront transplantation for transplant eligible patient is the standard of care. Do not delay transplantation. And you would hear more in the ASCO plenary session. And I can come back and tell you at that time when you heard the results of the US trial. Eligibility of a transplant should be determined by a transplant doctor. So sometimes I hear a patient is transplant ineligible. Who said that? It has to be said by a physician who is a transplanter. If a transplanter says someone is not transplant eligible, then the person is probably not transplant eligible. And risk stratification, personalized medicine, and all these new immunotherapies hold promise for future. And I believe in future, we'll be seeing more and more patients with multiple myeloma are being cured. And with that, I would end my talk. And thanks, Kelly, and thanks, IMF, and thanks all our, you know, the audience um, for uh, coming here and listening to this uh, conference. Sid, you absolutely nailed it. Thank you so much. That was a really great presentation. We're going to hold off on questions till after Tiffany. We have a few for you. But thank you, thank you, thank you. That was an excellent presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to introduce a, a friend too, Tiffany Richards. We've known each other for, I don't know, two months or something like that. Yeah. And she's uh, one of our nurse leadership board members for the IMF. We are one of the only foundations that have that. And we think it's a great program. And you can see what they do off our website. But without me wasting any time here, Tiffany, take it away. Thank you, Kelly. Um, so I'm going to be talking about how to manage myeloma symptoms and side effects. So we're going to talk about how life is a canvas and uh, you are the artist. And so one of the things I think it's really important for patients to know is that one, it's important that you know your care team, not just your physician, but maybe your nurse practitioner, or physician's assistant, your nurse, your scheduler. Um, all of us really work together um, to improve your care and also improve your experience. We also want to make sure that you are brought into the decision making process um, and that you're also using reliable resources that you're not just Googling, um, asking Dr. Google, as I like to say, um, how your myeloma should be treated or even asking patients out in the waiting room, because I know there's a lot of talk that happens between patients. So one thing that's important to know is that you are central to your care team, right? So you're kind of in the middle and then everybody else is around you. So you may have your myeloma specialist. Um, and if you're living further away from a myeloma specialist, you're likely to have your general oncologist. You have the pharmacist where you pick up your medications. You should have a primary care provider because other things can happen in the midst of having multiple myeloma. You may have sp subspecialists, you may have a cardiologist, a lung doctor, um, you may have an orthopedic doctor, um, then your allied health staff, so your uh, nurse practitioner, your PA, your nurse, um, and then your support network. Um, so that would be your family and friends and your support group uh, that you attend. And so myeloma is a chronic disease, right? And so we have to look at the long haul. And so it's really important that you understand the role of all the different people that's in your care team. 
It's important to ask questions um, so to help you better understand. Um, so I usually, you know, tell patients like pick your top four most important questions, especially if you're, you know, in going to see a myeloma specialist, like pick those top four questions that are the most important to you. Make sure that you're participating in the decisions, right? Make sure that you understand why they are recommending the treatment over another treatment. And then also know your history. Like that is so important to make sure you're keeping accurate notes. Um, I know we, you know, when we have patients that have been treated locally and then they come to us and while we try to get records from the other institutions, sometimes we don't get all of the records. And so it's really, really helpful if the patient comes and they're like, yes, I got this treatment from this date to this date. Um, and this is kind of the, res I had a response to this, right. And this is when I progressed and then they changed me to this treatment. So that's also really important. And there are different tools that you can use. The IMF has the myeloma manager to help you manage that. Now we're doing it. Oh, there we go. <laughs> um, so we want you to be empowered to be part of the treatment decision ma making uh, process, right? So we want to make sure that you are able to have time to consider options. So you may be sitting there really overwhelmed with all this information that you just were told, and you might need some time to talk about it and have a discussion with your family. Um, make sure you use reliable sources of information. So like I said, not just Googling, going to Dr. Google and asking Dr. Google how myeloma should be treated. But for example, the IMF has just a plethora of information and hand uh, booklets that you can get to help you to better understand. You really want to use caution when you consider, when you're hearing stories from other patients, right? So, you know, you could have patient A that had a really bad experience with a drug regimen, right? But another person could have just breezed through it. So you don't really want to take like the personal stories to make your decision on. Consider your goals. What are your values and what are your preferences? So maybe you have to work and it's gonna be really difficult for you to come to an infusion therapy center. Um, and so maybe you um, need to do an oral regimen and that may not be the ideal situation, but maybe you need your insurance. And so, you know, it's important to bring those things to the table and see how can your team work with you. Um, and so when, when you're expressing your goals, I would say like my top priority is X, Y, and Z, right? Um, additionally, these also preferences are also important. Um, and so that's one way that you can kind of frame, um, when you're having that discussion. And so you want to take into consideration your, not only your preference, but your data from research and then your myeloma specialist experience, clinical experience in treating patients with multiple myeloma. And so now we're going to talk about the color wheel of treatments. So we're going to look at myeloma treatment and supportive therapies, right? So the goal of myeloma treatment is to get the disease under control rapidly and effectively. But not only do we want the disease to be responsive, but we want to have a du durable disease control. We also want to make sure that we're minimizing the side effects that you're experiencing so that you can have a good quality of life. And most importantly, we want to improve your survival, right? Then we have supportive therapies. And so these we may use to manage like your bone disease. So you may be on, you know, Zometa or Xiva. And then also management of your treatment related side effects is really important. We also want to optimize symptom management because we know that if we manage your symptoms right, you'll end up staying on therapy. And then that will improve your quality of life. And so again, it's important to discuss your goals and your priorities with your healthcare team. And so if we look at the myeloma big picture, um, I know um, we've had discussions about this. We have initial therapy, then we have transplant, we have maintenance, we have treatment of relapse disease. Um, and then those are gonna be broken up into tra transplant eligible versus transplant ineligible. And then we have the supportive care therapies that's gonna apply to everybody. 
So there are different shades of auto stem cell transplant, right? So they're, again, clinical experience, the data from research, and then patient preference. And there are no black and white answers to decide to undergo a transplant. Um, you know, transplant is a commitment for not only yourself, but also your partner. And it's really important that you understand the process um, because that will help you to focus on the elements uh, needed to decide if and when to go to transplant. So we know that can, studies continue to support early transplant versus delayed transplant, right? Um, quality of life should be considered when deciding on timing. Um, and then allogen, allogeneic transplant is not currently recommended as initial therapy. And so if we break up transplant into three phases, we have phase one where um, eligibility is determined. Then we have the actual transplant. And then we have the final phase, which is post-transplant. So in the first phase, you know, it's when this is when you're undergoing induction therapy, right? And during this process, we generally send you um, at our center, we send you the transplanters so that they can start working on getting insurance authorization while you're undergoing transplant so that when your disease is ready for you to go move forward to transplant, the insurance authorization has already been determined. We also make sure that we get um, echocardiograms and uh, lung function studies in order to make sure to see what your heart and your lung function is like. Um, and similar to what Dr. Gangjuli Geng said is, you know, a transplanter is really the person to decide if you're transplant eligible or not. And we don't use age as a factor um, in determining if you're transplant eligible or not. It's really, we look at your performance status, we look at your heart and lung function, things like that. And even with performance status, that's a little bit, um, can be a little bit difficult because maybe your performance status, meaning like how active you are, maybe you're wheelchair bound right now because you had multiple compression fractures and you're not able to get up and walk because of pain. And once we get the disease under control and we manage your symptoms, you will become more mobile. So. It's kind of, again, just like what has been said, you're, the transplant doctor should be the one to make that determination. Um, and this, the eligibility will um, occur at a transplant center. Then we have the actual transplant. So you'll receive high dose chemotherapy, um, usually over two days, and then you receive the stem cell infusion. During this time, you're getting supportive care to kind of help manage, prevent infections, help to promote engraftment, meaning how well those stem cells go into your bone marrow and repopulate your bone marrow. And this takes about three to four weeks. And then post-transplant, this is going to be the time when you're re-strengthening, your appetite is going to begin to improve. And then about 90 days post-transplant is when you begin maintenance therapy. And a lot of times this is being done at home and not at the transplant center anymore. So your care partner is really important, right? So it's important to have them with you throughout all three phases, right? So we want you, we want them there so that they can be more informed about the process, understand what you're gonna go through, what their role is. Um, sometimes some transplant centers allow for outpatient transplant management so that you don't even have to be admitted. And then the last part, they're going to just be supporting you, giving you assistance because you're going to have to go and have counts checked and things like that. And your care partner doesn't just have to be one person. It could be a team of people that are rotating through. When we look at patient reported symptoms, we can kind of group them into three categories. We can group them into physical, psychological and financial. So physical are gonna be things like fatigue, constipation, neuropathy, sexual dysfunction. Psychological is gonna be depression, anxiety, decreased cognitive function, decreased role in social function. And then also, and then financial is gonna be the financial toxicity as well as the financial burden. When we look at different side effects, so we can group, we can look at GI symptoms, and that can either be constipation or diarrhea. And we know that diarrhea can be caused by some of the medications that we give you to manage your myeloma. Um, but they also could be that if you're taking stool softeners and laxatives, that could also cause diarrhea. Or maybe you're on magnesium because your magnesium level is low, and that can also cause diarrhea. Um, also, sugar substitutes um, can cause diarrhea. So maybe you're diabetic and you're eating more sugar-free, and that can also cause that. 
As far as management, you can use um, over-the-counter Imodium um, initially if you're on uh, lenalidomide. Sometimes cholestopol can help um, or cholestyramine can help be helpful for that. You can also try fiber binding um, agents such as Metamucil or Citrusel or Benafiber can be helpful. Um, if for constipation, this also can be caused by the medications we give to manage the myeloma, but maybe you're on pain medicine. Um, some blood pressure medicines can cause that. So you, first, I usually tell people try and increase their fiber intake. Um, you can also try fiber binding agents, but you just need to make sure that you're drinking enough fluid because um, otherwise it can actually cause the opposite problem and actually cause you more constipation. But sometimes we do have to give you um, some medicines to help uh, relieve the constipation, either over the counter, things like Sinecot S or Metamucil, or, I'm sorry, Miralax um, can be helpful. The other thing that is really helpful with constipation is activity. So, you know, getting up and going for walks. Your bowel likes um, exercise. How, what about pain? I know, you know, a lot of patients with myeloma have a significant amount of pain, and it could be from compression fractures. It could be um, because maybe you had a fracture of your arm because of the myeloma. Um, and so it's really important that you're managing your pain. Um, and also during that time, sometimes it's not just um, narcotics that can be used, but sometimes they use um, gabapentin or pregabalin to help manage the nerve pain that some patients get. And so it's really important that we try to prevent pain. So we may place you on bone strengtheners to help decrease your fracture risk. Um, we want you to be on an antiviral such as valcyclovir or acyclovir to help prevent shingles while you're on therapy. Um, we also will sometimes use radiation therapy to help minimize your pain. But other, we can also use complementary therapy, such as acupuncture, can actually be really beneficial for patients, particularly those with neuropathy. We can use that as well um, to help manage your pain. What about peripheral neuropathy? So one way to minimize uh, neuropathy is to administer bortezomib once weekly, and then also to make sure you're receiving that as a subcutaneous injection. Um, so let's say you're on twice weekly bortezomib and you're starting to have some symptoms, some numbness, tingling, then we can switch you to a once weekly regimen to help minimize that. Want to make sure that your, um, vitamin B levels are, um, adequate because if those are low, that can cause symptoms. Sometimes we can use, um, B complex vitamin, uh, vitamins to help with that. If you do have neuropathy, you really wanna make sure that you have a safe environment. So um, I usually tell patients, get rid of those like, you know, area rugs, things like that, because that's something you could easily trip on. Make sure that you're wearing shoes or um, house slippers when you're walking around because you don't wanna step on something sharp because you may not feel it. Um, and neuropathy can be anything from numbness, tingling, to pain or burning sensation, a sensitivity to touch, your hands or feet could feel really, really cold, um, or some patients describe it as walking on hot coals. And so it's really, really important that you let your team know if you're starting to have those symptoms and not wait till it becomes really bad and you're having problems walking. Um, and physical therapy can also help with that. What about fatigue, anxiety, and depression? So almost all patients have some amount, some degree of fatigue um, when they have myeloma, and particularly when they're on therapy. And it can be caused from your hemoglobin being low. It could just be because of chronic pain. It could be due to reduced activity. It could be because you're on steroids, you're not sleeping well at night. And um, it could be just from treatment as well. Um, and so it's really important that you discuss this with your providers. Anxiety can, um, has reported in over 35% of patients, depression in about a quarter, and financial concerns, disease progression, end of life, 
how well you're um, interacting socially can be impacted. And I think over the last two years with COVID, anxiety and depression is actually even higher than what it was pre-COVID. Um, and so it's important that you share these symptoms with your provider. And I usually tell my patients with anxiety and depression, if they're hesitant to go on medication is, you know, if, if you started developing diabetes from the steroids that you were on and I said, okay, we need to start you on something for your blood sugars. Would you say to me, no, I can just will myself to bring my blood sugars down. That's ridiculous, right? You would never say that. You'd never be like, I'm just going to pull my boots up by my bootstraps and push through it. And that's going to bring those sugars down. It's not realistic. Um, and the same thing, it, that's the same thing with our brain. Sometimes our brains are producing chemicals that are making us feel sad and anxious. And really the, sometimes the only way that that can be managed is with medications. Um, and I think over the last two years, probably the whole entire planet could use some good antidepressants because it has just really been a rough two years. So you know, there's no shame in taking something to make you feel better because honestly, um, it can be really disabling. And so it's important that you have good rest and relaxation. You want to make sure you're getting adequate rest and sleep. Um, things that can interfere with sleep are steroids, alcohol, fear, stress. Um, it may be that you have sleep apnea, um, inactivity can cause it. And so sleep hygiene is really important. You want to make sure that you're um, engaging in some sort of activity, um, but not near bedtime. Try to avoid taking naps during the day. Um, only spend time in your bed when you go to sleep, and you may need a sleep aid. Um, and then obviously you want to make sure that you're avoiding caffeine near bedtime. Um, and probably also, I know, um, as we get older, you know, those nighttime trips to the bathroom can increase. And so, um, minimizing the amount of fluid that you drink in the evening also will be helpful. As far as strategies for healthy living, you want to manage stress. You want to make sure that you're maintaining a healthy weight. We usually don't say that there's a specific diet, just maintain your weight. Um, you want to make sure that you're staying up to date with your health screenings, vaccines, that you stop smoking. Make sure that you're staying adequately hydrated um, and then making sure that nobody is giving you IV contrast for CT scans because that can impact your kidney function. And then you want to make sure that you're protecting your bones, that you're getting enough calcium and vitamin D in your diet, and that you're staying on um, bone strengthening agents. As far as financial burden, we know that in myeloma, there's a huge financial burden, either from co-payments, premiums, travel expenses, um, medical supplies, prescription drug costs. And then there's the loss of income because you may need time off of work, your caregiver may need time off of work, and so really important to look at funding and assistance programs, either through LLS, um, sometimes Medicare offers um, uh, some assistance. There's the Health Wealth Foundation. Um, there's pharmaceutical support that can be of assistance. And then there's some nonprofit organizations like Cancer Care um, that can be helpful as well. And so make sure that you talk to your social worker to find out what resources there are that you can take advantage of. And just remember, you are not alone in this journey. Not only do you have your caregivers and your friends and your family, but you also have um, the folks at the International Myeloma Foundation that can provide you with the information that you need um, to help you during this journey um, and to give you accurate information about myeloma and its treatment. Wow, Tiffany, again, thank you. This is that was a great present. You, you guys seem to change the deck every time I do a presentation. I keep getting better and better. I like the wheel. That's that's a good thing for people. And one thing that we we talk about is the financial toxicity, and and that can really get you depressed and put you all over the place. And you just know you you're not alone out there with the IMF. We we have a very helpful info line, and we have a very helpful employees and. We're all here for the myeloma patients. That's what we get up for at the IMF is myeloma patients. So Tiffany, thanks. Sid, are you on right now? 
I'm still on. I'm right here. Oh, good. I, I hear you. And Tiffany, I've got a couple of questions. Let me go over to the... Uh, I've been on maintenance revlimid since two or uh, 2020, but now my numbers of kappa light chains are increasing. Could I benefit from a CDK6 inhibitor? So I will take that. Um, so in the beginning, we discussed about the biochemical progression and relapse, and it seems like uh, this could be a biochemical progression, making sure that this does not progress to clinical or symptomatic relapse. So your oncologist would be able to differentiate between biochemical relapse from symptomatic relapse. If it is symptomatic relapse, then definitely that needs to be treated. If it is a biochemical relapse, even then, if it is a rapid progress, on the biochemistry, that means the clinical relapse is coming, so you might like to intervene sooner. Other than that, if it is just a free kappa, slightly rising, then you may not need to. Um, when the time comes to change the therapy, it bottom line would be decided by your oncologist about what previous treatments you had, whether you had transplant or not, and based on those exposure and the history of refractoriness or sensitivity thereof of previous drugs, a combination treatment can be chosen by the oncologist. I know of no CDK6 inhibitor trial for multiple myeloma. I'm not a solid tumor, but I believe CDK6s are approved for other cancers like breast, et cetera, but I do not know any CDK6 for a myeloma. Right. Here's always a question I get. Do I need to take DEX? I tell them yes, because you're supposed to do the dishes at night and upset your <laughs> wife. <laughs> so DEX is... Talk to me about um, that. So DEX is actually, we have a love and hate relationship with DEX, not only being a myeloma physician, but also being a transplanter and dealing with an, another condition called graft facessose disease. DEX is very important in the early treatment of multiple myeloma. Plasma cells hate DEX. DEX actually can cause plasma cell lysis. So if you see all the triplets, or doublets, there was always the DEX. Now, one advantage that has happened now, we understand that we do not need high-dose DEX. Even low-dose DEX once a week is enough. And above the age of 70, I may not even use 40 milligram. I may just use 20 milligram. After the disease is controlled, often I drop DEX and I almost never use DEX as a part of the maintenance. So yes, DEX has a lot of side effects and we need to learn how to deal with that, but DEX is almost integral part of the initial induction therapy. Um, an interesting question from one of our viewers. Are there any holistic routes as a patient can use? Let me take that and then I'll ask uh, Dr. Richards to help that. Um, so from the very beginning, we are saying that the to treat myeloma, it needs a village. And if you really look into the etymology of the word holistic, it is a wholesome treatment. So not only the providers, the physicians, nurse practitioners, we need social workers, dietitians, uh, physical therapists, acupuncture, all of them together can help our patients with both the treatment of the myeloma as well as the symptom control. If somebody thinks about holistic, meaning alternative medicine, I'll just go back to Dr. Richard as saying that you cannot control your blood glucose of 350 with mental strength that I am going to bring my 350 blood sugar down to 80. It ain't happening. You need insulin. Yeah. So if somebody has symptomatic multiple myeloma, you do need approved therapy for multiple myeloma. And on top of that, I 100% agree with supportive measures, well-balanced diet. If somebody says that you need antioxidants, go to market, buy blueberry. Do not buy a pill that contacts the <laughs> antioxidants. Get it from the natural source. If somebody tells me, how about turmeric? We, I'm from India. We start eating turmeric when you are one year old. Do you want to say that there is no multiple myeloma in India? It's a ton of multiple myeloma in terminic eating Indians, okay? So they may have supportive help, but they are not by themselves going to help your multiple myeloma. So yes, holistic approach is important, but it has to be done under a myeloma team specialist. Excellent. Tiffany, do you have anything to add to that? 
No, I would just agree with that. And I think a lot of times people look at supplements and think, oh, I'm just going to take all these supplements. But you also need to be careful um, because, you know, the supplements can also interact with um, medications. It can cause um, increased risk of bleeding. So if you're already on a blood thinner, so it's really important that you know, you talk to your team about what it is that you're wanting to take um, before you start taking it. Um, and I agree. I mean, we know that if we get um, vitamins from whole foods, that that is better um, than taking a pill. So just eating a healthy diet, eating your fruits and vegetables, and you won't need to take extra pills. <laughs> yes, mom. Thank you. I want my vegetables. You know, I, there was a time where I got on blood pressure medicine and he says, we got to, we got to fix your blood and so forth in a way he's saying it. And then he goes, no more greyhounds. And he said, grapefruit juice is bad for medication. So that was a sad day. Not, not really. <laughs> okay. So holistic, are there any, well, he, the person's asking about antidepressants. Where is there a negative reaction with common MM medications or how would you handle that? Someone saying they're depressed. Uh, Tiffany, go ahead and talk to me about that. Yeah. Um, so it really depends on the degree of the depression that there is. Um, if it's mild, then we may start something, but we usually will refer them to, um, our, the psychiatry department at, um, where I work, um, just because they're experts at managing depression and anxiety. Um, and I find that, um, you know, sometimes not, you know, if you try one antidepressant and you're not getting relief they they know how to add things to it or to change things out. Um, and so it is important that you talk about that, um, because you don't have to feel that way. Um, and the dexamethasone will even make mm. it already, uh, you know, make it worse, right. Cause you're having the mood swings and you're up and down. Um, so it's important to talk about it and not feel shame by it. Um, and so, you know, talk about it and let your providers know. Yeah. All under doctor supervision and the team supervision is what I want to give a takeaway there over time. What toll do the standard maintenance drugs take on the immune system? Two years, three years, five years. Can you talk about that Sid? Um, so it also depends on what kind of maintenance drugs. Some of the maintenance drugs definitely lower the immune system, especially deratumumab that causes low immunoglobulin levels, hypogamma globulinemia. Um, bortezomib can cause neuropathy. Uh, Lenalidomide uh, can cause low blood counts. So the immune system definitely would be lowered, especially after the transplant. It tends to get better as the time progresses, but we do need to be vigilant. We need to, do need to continue our vaccination schedules. And um, uh, if at any time anybody develops any sign of infection, you need to go and seek for help right away rather than delaying um, and getting that infection advanced. So yes, it does decrease the immune system to some extent, but overall still, if you take 100 patients that are on maintenance and there's a fear of the low immune system, and secondary primary malignancies and other things, you still come ahead by beating the number of relapses of myeloma being on maintenance than not being on maintenance, especially if somebody is MRD positive. Now, if somebody is MRD negative and is sustained, one can have a discussion whether it is safe to stop the maintenance and let the immune system recover and upon relapse of the disease, go back again on maintenance or treatment. Well, I don't know how to spell a cyclovir. The, the question says, what is a cyclovir as it relates to my myeloma treatment? So I'll take that. Um, as um, we know, there are increased risk of infections with the diagnosis of myeloma, with the chemotherapy of myeloma, transplantation. So, so we give a different kind of preventive therapy. One of the prevention is to prevent herpes simplex virus that causes cold sore and herpes zoster virus that causes shingles or in ch children who never had chickenpox can cause chickenpox. So 
patients that are on bortezomib or Valgade, they are at a higher risk of developing shingles. And hence, we put patients on prophylactic preventive medicines to prevent that. That could be Val acyclovir or acyclovir. So those are the two medicines that we use to prevent risk of viral infections like shingles or cold sores. Great. Now here's a question that's problematic. The attendee says members of a supporting group in San Francisco told me if you perform CAR T, emulogy, I have a hard time pronouncing that word. Then you have to go into hospice first. It looks like this would be discouraging to have CAR T. This is something that upsets me a lot when people just don't talk to a doctor about it. Do you have to go to hospice first or after you get your CAR T? I think this is something like a lost into translation issue. Okay. Um, sometimes what happens is if patients have advanced myeloma and had used CAR T, and if the CAR T fails, and at that time, many patients do not have too many options, do not have too many standard of care options. And at that time, the choices are between um, using some other drugs that we have used before, but that could be too toxic, or clinical trials that may or may not be patient eligible for, or sometimes, you know, quality of life trumps quantity of life. Some patients may say that, you know, I fought enough. I am now on the fifth line of treatment. My cardi has failed. Maybe I would concentrate more on quality time with my family, and I do not want to get poked and prodded by clinical trials and going from door to door. And at that time, maybe supportive care and hospice is appropriate. But no, you don't need to go to hospice before CAR-T. I think that is a lost in translation um, issue here. Yeah, that was a big question from him. Uh, if you're on DPD and relapsed, can you go on to use further treatment using DARA? Um, Sounds like he's on DARA already. Yeah. So, so if somebody is relapsing after DARA palm decks, the issue then would be to find a drug that would approach the multiple myeloma cells from a different perspective. And usually in those situations, we like a proteasome inhibitor like carfilzomib and maybe even a BCMA or venroclax or something like that. Patients that have failed data or data refractory, the other anti-CD38 antibody, isatuximab, also does not have a too great uh, uh, a, a chance. So. So it's difficult to say if the patient is progressing because of the entire DPD or just a part of it. Uh, the patient may have data sensitivity if you can just replace the P with the kyprolis and try DKG. I have seen somebody is doing that, and I would probably just use, if it is DPD to DKD, where the data is reused, probably for a couple of cycles, and you get your answer right away if the patient is responding or not. And if the patient is not responding, if you keep the data on board and just change the POMA list, then the patient is refractory to raritomumab and probably needs to go to some other treatment and most likely would be a BCMA type of treatment, which would be either Blendrep, which is already approved, or the clinical trials with CAR-T or approved CAR-T with IDCell or Siltacell. Okay. Um, I had a stem cell transplant in 2019 for Kappa Light Chain MM. On Revolid, ma Revolid Maintenance, two modern Moderna vaccines, January and February, and 2020, and a booster. Should I now get the fourth Moderna booster? Dr. Richards? Or wait till, or wait till the fall? Um, so we're recommending the fourth booster for our patients. Okay. I think people get scared about that and their diseases. One thing I remember, did someone talk about Revlimid and the vaccines that you have to, you can stay on Revlimid or you have to get off Revlimid? You can stay on Revlimid. Okay, good. There's, there's a couple of false things that I've found in a few things. Uh, let me look through here, holistic hospitals. So, oh, financial services and social services. Are they at most hospitals, uh, the patient's asking? So all hospitals should have a social worker that you can speak with. Um, and 
they'll be able to help you get, you know, get the names of different resources that are available to you um, in your community. Um, also, you know, a lot of times if you go to the drug company websites, they have patient assistance programs and not just for the drug themselves, but um, sometimes they can provide other um, assistance. Um, and some uh, medical centers do partner with Uber, Uber Health, um, to get assistance with getting travel back and forth to infusion therapy centers. So um, I would definitely, you know, ask to speak with your social worker to find out what services are available to you. Um, I mean, I have some patients, they're super savvy. I'm like, I just need to get them to sit down and like write out all of the things that they've been able to sure. access. Right. Sure. They're just, they know how to get that information and it would be really helpful for a patient. So. Okay. All right. Thank you. And bite is bite the same as by specific antibody treatment you mentioned. If not, can we discuss this a little more? I think Dr. Fonsek already answered that question. Bite Maybe is, they got on leg. Yeah. Bite is um, a structure protein that gets the CD3 and the BCMA or CD3 or whatever age, uh, whatever receptor you're targeting. Um, and this is from Amgen. Uh, the structure of that changes from a bispecific antibody, which is looking like a Y and IgG. Um, so they work the same way, but their uh, protein structures are different. And Byte is from Amgen company. Got it. Uh, neuropathy, something that you both deal with quite a bit. Uh, enomological, these enomological therapies either cause or make neuropathy worsen. Are there any drugs out there that do not, that, that do not affect the patient's, excuse me, that affect the patient's neuropathy? My husband tried Revomed and Pomelis and could not tolerate either because of his severe neuropathy. Yeah, Go ahead, Tiffany. Fun. Yeah, that's a tough one, particularly when the neuropathy is so bad, um, even Drugs like Revlimid and Pomelis that have a low incidence of neuropathy can make it worse. Uh, Daratumumab um, and Isatuximab generally don't cause it, but they have to be combined with another agent. And Revlimid's incidence of neuropathy is less than 10%. Same with Carfilzomib. So you still have that risk. Um, cyclophosphamide, which is an older drug, but can doesn't usually cause neuropathy either, but again, we have to combine that usually with another drug. So unfortunately, it's it's tough to try and find a regimen that a patient can tolerate um, while trying to control the myeloma. Okay. I would also add to that is often um, patients that are on a triplet and the DEX can cause hyperglycemia, high sugar. And if the diabetes is not controlled, that could contribute to worsening neuropathy. So um, once somebody has um, neuropathy, just make sure that there is nothing else going on that is um, adding to the neuropathy, like uh, uncontrolled diabetes. Yes, that's a good point there. Uh, at the beginning of relapse, how do you know when to begin the next step of treatment? Do you wait until your M spike is at a certain level? And how does this affect the light change? So this goes back to the same question that we answered in the past, relapse, biochemical relapse progression. So um, when um, we are monitoring, and if it is asymptomatic, means there is no worsening of anemia, no new bone lesion, we call it biochemical progression. Um, there, there are definitions of progressions, like more than you know, 10 milligram per deciliter of free light chain on more than 25% of the baseline. Um, so by by that definition, if there is a biochemical progression, often we may not intervene or change the treatment, especially if it is a slow progression. If it's a symptomatic progression, absolutely we need to change the treatment. If somebody has rise in the M protein or rise in the kappa and it goes by more than 25% and uh, uh, and the gradient, the, the curve with the steep, that means it's fast biochemical, even then sometimes we change treatment. But it's a slow biochemical progression, it's probably okay to observe for some time. Okay, that's good. And I'm going to finish with one last question that you did talk about, Sid, but this just popped up again. Many things determine that if a, a patient is transplant eligible. This patient seems to be brand new and is in the process of collecting stem cells and doing all this stuff. 
But what made them transplant eligible? Was there certain things that popped up that you would that you would look at, Sid, or what is it that is a common thread here? I think Dr. Richards also mentioned that uh, age is not a bar. So I have transplanted an 82 year old, and that's also pushing it. Um, so, so it's not the age, it is the performance status for underlying other comorbidities. So we check out the heart, check out um, uh, lung functions, um, and um, how the day-to-day -day, um, living, and if uh, by the those tests by a transplanter, if somebody is eligible, then we say the patient is transplant eligible. So there are strict criteria that a pre-transplant evaluation physician and coordinators go through. And if you get the green checks, then you are transplant eligible. So uh, age is not one of them. Oh, well, that's good. Cause I got older this year. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, you two, I, I said, I can't thank you enough for getting on the, the call today. I really appreciate your talks and I look forward to seeing you in person for a meeting. Okay. Uh, we all got to figure this next step out about how we meet. And Sid, you're right up there in the, the big shining globe to make sure you get a chance to do one of these at your hospital. Tiffany, on the other hand, I don't know what to say about you. You're a mess. <laughs> I'm kidding. Listen, thank, <laughs> thank you for everything, Tiffany. You've been grand today as always. And everyone, remember, she's on the Nurse Leadership Board, which is on our website at myeloma.org. And you'll see a bunch of papers they produce that are amazing, simply amazing. So without further ado, I will say goodbye to both of you. And thank you for again for Saturday. Thank you. Working thank you. with us. Thank you. Thank you. All right, can we road the slides now? Okay, listen, follow up today's workshop. We will be emailing you uh, the speaker slides and the video replay. So if you got, you wanna adjust this a little bit, go from mile on 101 to clinical trials, you can do so. This is on our website plus other programs, patient family seminars, more regional community workshops, IMWG, International Myeloma Working Group, all these acronyms that you need. One other thing I'd like to add about our website is we do have a, an acronym list that will help you get through your initial consultations because when people get busy, they throw acronyms and, and definitions out and you have no idea what they're doing. This is part of your arsenal. Getting all this people together to help you because it's yeah, you need it. You just can't do it by yourself. And I, I think that that's why we like you to go to the myeloma.org website. Next slide. And then I can't do this. And we can't do this without our generous sponsorship from our sponsors. Amgen, GSK, Cario Farm, Bristol Myers Squibb, Jensen, and Takeda. They're great organizations that help us out, and they've sponsored this program. Next slide. That's it for today. Thank you for coming to our workshop, and I look forward to seeing you in another workshop in the future. Have a great weekend. <laughs>